Hey everybody, this is the last online lecture for this section, uh, uh, this day, and it is from chapter 20, which is all about trig with any angle. And for section 20.1, we're going to introduce you to vectors. And the thing you need to know about vectors is there are two items that describe a vector. The first item that you need to give is the magnitude. And the second item is the direction. So you need to know both pieces of information to fully describe a vector. The magnitude is just a fancy um, way of asking you for the length of the vector. So you can find the magnitude with geometry um, just like you would find the hypotenuse of a, of a triangle. Um, you can use it to find the magnitude. Now, the place that you're going to start your vector is called the um, tail, and the place that you end the vector is called the head. But in this book, they just refer to them as the beginning and the end point. And for um, any vector, you can place it anywhere in the xy plane. But if they ever tell you that you are in standard position, then that means you're in um, beginning point is at the origin and your ending point will be somewhere in the coordinate system. It could be anywhere. But standard point, uh, standard position does mean that you need to start at the origin when you go to draw your vector. If they ask you to calculate the magnitude, you can use the formula um, where you take the x-coordinate and square it, the y-coordinate and square it, add the two quantities together, and then square root the result. And that will get you the magnitude of any vector that is in standard position. For this course, we're going to stay in standard position. As you advance through the math curriculum, you may um, shift your vector out or away from the origin, but for this class we're going to stick with it. If you find that formula confusing, remember you can just do Pythagorean theorem and that does the exact same thing as the formula. So for example, let's say that I asked you to find the magnitude to the nearest tenth and I gave you a vector that was in standard position and it had an endpoint of 4, 3. So all that means is if you were to graph it, it would have started at the origin, it would have moved right four units, it would have moved up three units, just like we plot any old point, and you would get this vector right here. So what a lot of folks like to do is they like to make it look like a right triangle, and they know that the bottom of the triangle would be 4, and the side of the triangle would be 3, and they are solving for the hypotenuse of the triangle. So to do that, you can use good old a squared plus b squared equals c squared if you want, or you can use the formula above. If you're going to use the formula above, you take the x-coordinate of 4, and you square it, which is 16, you take the y-coordinate of 3 and you square it, which is 9. You add the two quantities together and you square root the result. So if you were to add 16 and 9 together, you would get 25. And if you were to square root 25, you would get a value of 5. So in this situation, the magnitude of your vector, which just means the length of the vector, is 5 units long. Okay, so if you don't like that method, you can use um, Pythagorean's theorem if you want. But let's try one more. So I want to know what the magnitude of the vector is that is in standard position and has an endpoint at negative 2, 5. You take your x quantity of negative 2 and you square it. And you square it. Remember that a negative times a negative equals a positive. You take your y quantity of negative 5 and you square it. Remember that a negative times a negative equals a positive. You add the result together, which is 29, and you can square root that result. And the square root of 29 to the nearest tenth comes out to be 5.5. So if I was to draw a vector 
from the origin to the point negative 2, negative 5, the length of that vector would be 5.4 units long, approximately. Now the second item that will come up when you're talking about vectors is the direction of the vector. Now the direction of the vector is always going to be the angle when you move counterclockwise from the positive x-axis. Okay, so for example, if we were looking at this acute angle, I'm calling it acute because when I form the angle with the positive x-axis, notice that it is less than 90 degrees. But if I look at the angle that's in the third quadrant, if I were to start with the positive x-axis, I would have to go significantly more than that. So to get from the x-axis to your y-axis, that's 90 degrees. The y-axis back to the x-axis is another 90 degrees, and then you'd have to find the difference between the x and the y. So just keep in mind you're always moving counterclockwise. That is the positive direction for the way the angles move. So if I ask you to find the direction of a vector, what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to find the angle between the positive x-axis and the vector itself. So it could be anywhere from 0 degrees to 360 degrees. For this class, we are going to stay in the first quadrant. And what happens is this becomes a trig problem just like we had in the last section. So for example, let's say that I was trying to find the direction of my vector that was in standard position but had an end point of 4, 3. If you were to draw that vector, you are looking for the angle between the positive x-axis and um, the angle. Now remember we could turn this into a right triangle where the base of my triangle is 4 and the height of my triangle is 3. So in relation to this angle I know the opposite side and I know the adjacent side which means I can find the size of angle theta by using the relationship of opposite over adjacent. Now you can remember that or which they give you in the box, or you can just remember that you need to take the y value divided by the x value. Now remember, to solve for theta, you need to do the inverse tangent function of 3 fourths, and that will give you the size of the angle. So for this problem, if I was to take inverse tangent of 3 fourths, let's say I was going to round to the nearest tenth, I would get roughly 36.9 degrees. Sometimes we prefer not to use rectangular coordinates. Don't let that terminology throw you off. Rectangular coordinates just mean x's and y's. And we use a different coordinate system called polar coordinates. Polar coordinates are really common when working with circles. So when you are using a polar coordinate, the points are going to be in relation to a fixed point, which they call a pole. So if you can think of the origin as a pole, and as your item rotates around, think of it as swinging around the pole. The fixed line that's swinging around the pole is going to be called R or radius. And you can calculate that um, by finding the radius of the circle or we have another formula that you can use. If they ask you to find the magnitude of the vector, that is just going to be R. And if they ask you to find the angle of the vector, they're going to name that theta. And so in polar coordinates, instead of having x's and y's, you'll have r's and thetas. Now you do need to know how to get from regular rectangular coordinates to polar coordinates, so let's take a look at that. There are several there are several conversion factors that you would need to use, and it's depending on if they have started you in rectangular and ask you to go to polar, or if they have started you in polar and asked you to go to rectangular. Again, this, these are formulas that I would give you on your test. So if they've started you in rectangular, you can find your R by taking the x squared plus y squared and then rooting the answer. 
you can find your theta by using your inverse tangent. So we already did an example like that. If they start you in polar and they want you to go to rectangular, you're going to have to use these conversion factors, which we'll do here in a second. Okay, so let's start with rectangular and work our way to polar. Okay, so they gave me a vector in standard position, and they told me that my vector was 3, 4, so it looks something like that. And the first thing they want me to do is they want me to switch it to polar. So first I need to find out what the r value is going to be. So I'm going to take the x value of 3 and square it, the y value of 4 and square it. I'm going to add the result together, and I'm going to root the result. Well, 9 plus 16 is 25, and when I root 25, I get 5. So the r value for that standard vector would be 5. Then I need to find my theta. So to find my theta, I'm going to take inverse tangent of the y value divided by the x value, and that will give me my theta. And again, you just go ahead and type that straight into your calculator. That's not something we would expect you to calculate by hand. And the inverse tangent of 4 thirds is going to turn out to be approximately 53.1 degrees. So when you go to write that as an ordered pair, you put the r value first, and you put the theta value second. And that's it. Let's try one more. Let's look at 5, 8, and I want you to convert that to polar. So we went right 5, we went up 8, and we got our vector in standard form. And I want to know what that is in polar. So first, we will find our r value, and we're going to find our r value by taking the x value of 5 and squaring it, the y value of 8 and squaring it. We're going to add the results together, which is going to give you 89, and we're going to root 89. The root of 89 is approximately 9.4, and that's your radius. Then we're going to find our theta, so we're going to take the inverse tangent of the y value divided by the x value. And we're going to let our calculator do that. And when we take inverse tangent of 8 fifths, we get approximately 58 degrees. So if I asked you to write this as an ordered pair, you'd put the r first and you'd put the theta second. Again, you do want to make sure that your calculator is in the proper mode. Now, if they ask you to go the other way, they want you to start sorry, in the polar coordinate, and they want you to end in regular rectangular, rectangular coordinates, then you need to use the other conversion factors. The r, uh, excuse me, the x is going to be equal to the r times cosine theta, so, and the y will be equal to the r times sine theta. So for this first example, in this problem, our r is 2 and our theta is 30. So if I'm looking for the x, I need to take 2 times the cosine of 30 degrees. So make sure that you are in degree mode. You can type that straight into your calculator. And when you do, you should get roughly 1.73. The y is going to be equal to the r times sine of the 30 degrees. Go ahead and type that into your calculator, and you should get approximately, well, this one turns out really nice, you get 1. So when you go to write your ordered pair, you'll put the x first and the y second. Now, for the second example, example B, notice that they don't have you in degrees. Notice that they have you in radians. So make sure you switch your calculator to radian mode. If you don't do that, you will get the answer wrong. So to get your x value, you need to take your r times the cosine of pi over 2. Remember, you need to be in radian mode, and you'll get an x value of 0. To get the y value, you need to take the r times the sine of pi over 2. Be in radian mode, and you'll get a y value of sorry 7. So your ordered pair would be 0, 7.
Okay, the other thing that um, may be asked of you is to add two vectors together. Now, if you are adding two vectors together, you will need to um, decide whether they are going in the same direction or in opposite directions because that does change how you do the problem. The easier of the two is if they are going in the same direction. If your two vectors have the same direction, which is just a fancy way of saying they have the same angle, then all you need to do is add their magnitudes together and the direction of the new vector will be the direction of the um, vectors you originally started with. So for example, on number five, I've asked you to add two vectors together. They both have a direction of 35 degrees. The magnitudes of the vectors are four and five. So the resultant vector would have a magnitude of four plus five. And since they share the same direction, it would go in the direction of 35 degrees. Sweet and simple, no issues there. But if they go in the op go in different or opposite directions, that is a little bit problematic. Okay? So if they go in opposite directions, you subtract the magnitude of the smaller vector from the magnitude of the larger vector, and this will give you the magnitude of the final vector. Then the final vector, the resultant vector, will have the direction of the vector with the larger magnitude. So for example, if we look at number six, you have a vector that goes in the direction of 60 degrees. It has a magnitude of six. You have a vector that goes in a direction of 240 degrees. It has a magnitude of four. So first things first is we will subtract the magnitude of the smaller vector, which is four, from the magnitude of the larger vector, which is six. So the magnitude of the resultant vector will be six minus four, which is two. Then you have to decide which direction that you are going to travel in. And to do that, you look at the magnitudes of the two items. So the bigger vector, magnitude six, that is going to be the direction that you travel in. So our direction for the resultant vector will be 60 degrees. Okay. One of the last topics that will be covered is a different format to write vectors in, and it is called complex form. So depending on what class you had before this, some it kind of looks like A plus B I, but in this class they're going to have it look like X plus Y I. So to find your X coordinate, you need to use the R cosine theta, and to find your Y coordinate, you need to use the R sine theta. Okay, so for example, let's say I gave you two vectors and they were already in complex notation and I wanted to know what the resultant vector was. All you have to do in that situation is just add the two vectors together. So we would take our 5 plus 3i and our 7 plus 2i and we would add it together and our resultant vector would come out to be 12 plus 5i. That's it. So keep in mind the 12 would be the x and the 5 would be the y. Okay. Then if they asked you to find the magnitude, since you know what the x and the y are, you can use the formula from before. To get your magnitude, you take your x value of 12 and you square it. You take your y value of 5 and you square it. You add the result together, which is 169, and you square root the result, which is 13. So the magnitude for the resultant vector would be 13. Last, if they ask you to find the direction, since you know x and y, you can use your previous formula that says your direction is equal to inverse tangent of the y value divided by your x value. So if we were to type that into our calculator, inverse tangent of y over x 
we would get an angle of roughly 22.6 degrees. So don't let the imaginary notation be tricky or scary. It's really the same thing, just a different look. Last, they may ask you to multiply by a scalar. A scalar is just a plain old whole number. It could be a number like 6 or 8 or negative 3. And whenever you multiply by a scalar, it's pretty simple. All you need to do is multiply the magnitude by the scalar, and that will tell you the magnitude of the resultant vector. Multiplying by a scalar does not change the direction. You will have the same direction as you started with. So for example, find the resultant vector if a vector of magnitude 2.8 and a direction of 45 degrees is multiplied by a scalar of magnitude 3. So to get your magnitude, all you need to do is take the magnitude of your current vector and multiply it by your scalar. So let's see, 2.8 times 3 would be 8.4. Your direction stays the same you would still be traveling in the 45 degree direction. Okay, good luck. Let me know if you have questions.